352, Gentle Shepherd, Come and Lead Us, 352. Shirley will lead us from the organ.
Good morning. My name is Daniel Yoder. I'm one of the pastors here at College Mennonite Church, and I'm glad that each of you are here this morning to worship with us, whether you are here in this place or worshiping with us through various forms of technology. And speaking of technology, many of us in the office woke up to our, a technical difficulty of our devices connecting with printers. So if you see more devices up here this morning, that's why. And if you have an opinion on what pastors use to read their notes, please bring that opinion to the congregational meeting on June 17th. <laughs> Today we continue to live into the promise of Pentecost, of this, the coming of the Holy Spirit to us. And we are especially reminded of that on this spring day here in Indiana. It's easy to look around us and see the Holy Spirit at work. What was once brown and dry and seemingly dead, is now bursting forth into color and new life. The Spirit is active, breathing life into all the growing things that are around us, bringing color to the earth on this beautiful spring day. So let us continue to celebrate by joining together in the call to worship that's printed in your bulletin. So let us give glory to God in the response. Gloria a Dios. A mighty wind has blown and tongues of fire have danced. Glory to God, Gloria a Dios. The Spirit is with us, just as Jesus promised. Glory to God, Gloria a Dios. God's Spirit is pouring out upon us. Worship God with joy. Glory to God, Gloria a Dios. Let's pray. Spirit of wind and flame, creator of life, Jesus of love, we come into your presence to give you glory. You created us in your image, you show us the way, and you nudge us to paths of righteousness. And so we come before you in worship. May our praise be pleasing to you today, O oh God. Amen. I invite you to take your green Sing the Journey book and turn to number 112, I Owe My Lord a Morning Song. And I invite you to stand if you are able.
in the same book, 32. If you believe and I believe, 32. We will sing it two times. I invite you to take out your purple Sing the Story book now and turn to number 104. We will sing the, the ostinato or the, the first couple lines of this song several times throughout our prayer this morning. Number 104, Come O Spirit, Come. And throughout the prayer, listen for the cue, Come Holy Spirit, and then we will sing together. Would you join me in prayer? Holy God, you are our guide, our sustainer, our friend. We come to you this morning to offer our prayers of thanksgiving and supplication. As we look around the world at school shootings, natural disasters, at wars, and world leaders bickering, we sometimes find it hard to see you. We find comfort in looking at times past and seeing where you showed up even in times that seemed hopeless. We thank you, God, that you never leave us or forsake us. Please break into this time we find ourselves in now and help us to see your face. Come, Holy Spirit. We give you thanks for the healing work that you do in our lives. You work through us and through the people around us to bring hope when our bodies and our minds and our spirits hurt. We realize every day that our bodies are finite and that they eventually come to an end. God, today we pray for Malui Alonzo and her family as they grieve the death of her father. As family members gather in Mexico, give them safety as they travel and the assurance of your love in this time of loss. We also pray for Jonah and Sarah Hostetler and their family as they grieve the death of their grandma, Kathy Hostetler. We know that her absence will be especially felt today as Jonah graduates from high school and we Pray that your presence will be with all of them in a very special and unique way today. Come, Holy Spirit.
God, we pray for those dealing with challenges and changes in life. This is a time of year when we come face to face with change, whether it's graduating or completing projects or grades of school, retiring, moving, birth, or other changes that seem to come as part of life's rhythms. We know that you show up in the midst of change, and we pray that your guidance will be, be, be made real to us now. We rejoice with Don Lukeman and the births of his great-grandchildren, Rhett and Braylon. And we celebrate with Carolyn Lichty and the birth of her great-grandson, Max. This morning, we also pray for high school seniors who are graduating today and in the coming week. Help them and their families to live these moments to the fullest, to celebrate what has been and what is to come. Come, Holy Spirit. Spirit of wind and flame, creator of life, Jesus of love, hear our prayers. Amen. Children, you are invited to come forward now while we sing together the song, Catch the Spirit. Many of the children will know this song from Bible school over the past couple years, and it's a very easy song to learn, so I invite all of you to sing along as you can. And for those of you who do know it, make sure you sing very loudly for others to catch on. Please. Do we have words? <laughs> All right. <laughs> that will help. <laughs> Come on. <Let's> <laughs> Thanks for the encouragement. <gasps> All right. There we go. Catch the spirit and let the spirit catch you. Catch the spirit and see what God can do. Catch the spirit, take a look at those around who Jesus is calling out to. Catch the spirit too. Catch the spirit and let the spirit catch you. Catch the spirit. around who Jesus is calling out to catch the spirit to well good morning everybody all right yes so last fall the first time you saw this box many of you we planted a bunch of seeds right and seeds were growing everywhere right well what do you notice now yeah, what was growing over here, it grew, and then it died. Here's some of the left, some of the dry, dead plants. That side's still growing really well, but this side, the seeds came to an end. So when something dies, what do we often do with it? Throw them away. Yeah, we yes, we we bury it. So let's quick little dig a little hole and bury some of these uh, pieces of grass. All right, and then we'll, we'll trade out and let some other people do the next step. So go ahead and bury these here. All right, good. And as they get buried, they will decompose and help feed the soil, which is what happened over there. Some of the things that died have helped the soil, and those have grown. Because this is so dirty. It is. Well, it's dirt, yes. That makes sense. All right, now. How many of you have ever looked really closely at a seed? Uh, me? 
Yeah, some of you, all right. Let's do that real quick here. All right, here are little bags with seeds in them. So everybody just take one, take a little bag. Don't open it, just look at the seeds really closely. What do you notice? Seeds. Yeah, what do they look like? Pumpkins. It looks like a fish. It looks like, a, yeah, they're all shapes and sizes. What was that, Caleb? Yeah, they've got little hairs, little dry things on them. Do these things look alive? No. No. They're kind of brown and shriveled. They look like, well, yeah. They kind of look a little dead. So should we bury them? Yeah. Okay. Let's do that. So you got, don't open these. I've got some other seed packets here we'll open up. But first, before we bury them, we have to make the soil ready. Looks like it's good here. All right, so um, how about everybody rotate around halfway? So those of you who are here, go down that way, and you guys come down this way, okay? Can we open these? Not yet, not yet. All right, come down here so you guys can help with this next part. So, all right. So here's what we're gonna do. Um, I want you to take a finger, stick it up in the air, those of you close by here, poke it, down. poke it down and draw a line. Now, now imagine, all right, now just look at this soil for a second. Imagine you were a little bitty ant and you got dropped in the soil and you were walking along and you went down and up and down and up and down. What would it be like? Uh, Bumpy. A hill? Yeah. It's kind of like mountains and valleys. Yep. There is a worm. So, that's good. Yep, we put worms in there a couple weeks ago. You're right. So, here's what we're going to do. We're going to take some of these dry, dead-looking seeds and put them down in these valleys. All right? You want to put some in? All right. Sprinkle them down in the valley there. Here, you, go. Here, you take some of these. I'll give you some. There you go. Here, you want some, Ava? All right, put them down in those valleys. All right, now, those dry, dead-looking seeds down in the valleys, can those things live like that? What else do they need? Water. Water, yeah, and sun, they got the soil. Right. So, uh, yeah, cover them up. We'll put a little water on them. All right. There you go. Help move it around. All right, that's good. Perfect. Now, we're going to keep an eye on this for the next couple weeks. Now, what have we done here? These dry, dead-looking seeds. They're in the soil. They will. Yeah, they'll start soaking up the water. They'll swell. They'll put a root down and they'll put a stalk up. And these dry, dead looking seeds will spring to life. God has used you and me and the soil and the water and the sun so that these, yes, you can take that one, to, you, to make these dry seeds that we weren't sure could live, to live. So this morning, we'll talk about that later. This morning, uh, as you hear Phil read through Ezekiel, keep some of these things in mind, all right? That God is using you, and the Holy Spirit is working in you to help these, some of these dry, dead-looking seeds to live. All right, let's pray. God, we thank you for life and for the hope that you give us that life can come in unexpected places. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So you can take these little packets home and you can either look at them and study them closer or you can plant them somewhere at your house and see what happens with them. All right? Okay. okay. You can grab your worship bags and head back to your seats. In the green, sing the journey book. Number 10, spirit working in creation, bringing order out of strife.
Our preacher for today is Phil Waite, our pastoral team leader. More technical difficulties today, it looks like. So. Would you please join me in a prayer of blessing for Phil? God of love and God of power, anoint Phil with your Holy Spirit as he preaches this morning. Fill him up and flow through him so that we and others may see and experience your love. In Jesus' name, amen. Fill him up. Was that a pun, Daniel? Was that meant to be a joke? I hope God has a sense of humor. The grace and peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. This is a reading from Ezekiel chapter 37. I'm not going to read the whole chapter. I'm tempted to, but I won't. The hand of the Lord came upon me, and he brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord and set me down in the middle of a valley. It was full of bones. He led me all around them. There were very many lying in the valley, and they were very dry. He said to me, Mortal, can these bones live? I answered, O Lord God, you know. Then he said to me, prophesy to these bones and say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, I will cause breath to enter you and you shall live. I will lay sinews on you and will cause flesh to come upon you and cover you with skin and put breath in you and you shall live and you shall know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I had been commanded and as I prophesied suddenly there was a noise, a rattling and the bones came together bone to its bone. I looked, and there were sinews on them, and flesh had come upon them, and skin had covered, covered them, but there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, prophesy to the breath. Prophesy, mortal, and say to the breath, thus says the Lord God, come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe upon these slain, that they may live. I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they lived and stood on their feet, a vast multitude. Then he said to me, Mortal, these bones are the whole house of Israel. They say our bones are dried up, and our hope is lost. We are cut off completely. Therefore prophesy and say to them, Thus says the Lord God, I am going to open your graves and bring you up from your graves. O oh, my people, and I will bring you back to the land of Israel, and you shall know that I am the Lord when I open your graves and bring you up from your graves, O oh, my people. I will put my spirit within you, and you shall live, and I will place you on your own soil, and then you shall know that I, the Lord, have spoken and will act, says the Lord. The word of the Lord. This is Memorial Day weekend, and maybe it's a little dangerous reading Ezekiel on Memorial Day weekend, uh, as you will see. Uh, we, as Mennonites, have a lot of ambivalence about Memorial Day weekend. Some of us have served uh, in the military in this congregation, or members of this congregation served in the military. Many of us have family members who have served, uh, family members who have been wounded, and some who have died in military service, in war. Uh, 
Myself, I'm from, I'm from a family. I grew up in a family where we didn't talk about military service much at all. We weren't Mennonite and weren't from a Peace Church tradition, uh, but we didn't have much in the way of firsthand experiences that we would share among ourselves about family members or extended family members who had served. I had an uncle who'd served in Korea um, that he never talked about his experience. I had a couple of aunts who uh, served in World War II and um, the wax or the waves, I can't even remember the, the details of that. Uh, my own parents were kind of the wrong age to be impacted by, by the great wars of our, of our country. So I didn't, it, it was not something that I grew up with, thinking about Memorial Day and thinking of it as a special day of remembering soldiers who suffered in war. And, and, uh, I grew up in a part of the country that, that was maybe you might, you might say the left, called the left coast, the, the urban west coast where uh, the sort of God and country mentality didn't really exist as maybe uh, some of you have, have experienced in the Midwest. In more recent years I thought more about Memorial Day and I thought more about uh, military service and there's several things I, I want to draw on as, as, uh, in thinking about that. Uh, the first thing I wanna, want to note is uh, the experience that our family had in England, in London, uh, in the summer of, of 2016 as part of the sabbatical that I was on. And it so happens that our uh, time in London uh, took place over July 1st, 2016. And July f uh, 1st, uh, 2016, turns out, was an important anniversary in English history. It was the 100th anniversary of the beginning of the Battle of the Somme. And on the first day of a battle that went on for five, four or five months, or five, six months, there were over 50,000, in one day, 50,000 British casualties. Over the course of that entire battle, one battle, over five months, there were nearly 500,000 British casualties, and, and the total casualties of the three million people who fought in that war was roughly 1.3 million. Uh, that's staggering. And so in London, in 2016, they were remembering this battle that hap had happened a hundred years prior, even before the birth of the Queen, a long time ago. And there were poppies all over, all over London. Everywhere you looked, there were poppies to remember those who suffered and who died in the war, in that great war, in that horrible war. And on July 1st, there was a special service, a very small service, but a special service at Westminster Abbey. And the Queen was there, and the Duke of Edinburgh was there, and it was a religious service, and we, were, we weren't there. We were watching on TV, uh, along with most everybody else. There weren't many people uh, there. We were actually were at Westminster Abbey the next day, and we saw the wreath that was laid by the Queen during that service. But there was a homily given by the Anglican clergyman on this day that uh, was kind of astounding to me, in part because it's not the kind of thing that we hear these days in our country. And the homily was critical of the behavior of the commanders and leaders of the country who led these young men to the slaughter to the slaughterhouse that was the Battle of the Somme. Over the course of those five months, the Allies managed to gain six miles of land and did nothing to hasten the end of the war. These lives, the homilist said, the clergyman said, were essentially wasted on account of the incompetence and pride of the leaders and commanders of the country. That's a Memorial Day 
homily. And it made me think and gave me pause. Uh, It was an important remembrance of those who have suffered and died in war, of the sacrifices that a whole country made. If you think of all those casualties, how many people were touched by those losses in the course of those months, and the ripple through generations. I am interested in the Civil War, and my interest has grown in recent years because I learned that I have an ancestor who was a casualty of war, who was mortally wounded in a battle in war. It was in Missouri, uh, the Battle of Pilot Knob, uh, not a large battle, but a strategically significant battle. And he fought with the Iowa Volunteer Regiment, the Union soldiers who were trying to hold down this fort from a from a Confederate army that was trying to create an uprising towards the end of the war in Missouri as kind of a last desperate effort uh, to, uh, for the South to win the war. And in this battle, they ended up destroying the fort and all uh, this army, this, this, this regiment, retreated. And, and there were a number of skirmishes and finally they reached uh, the railroad Uh, the railroad line and they had one final skirmish and it was in that final skirmish before they were able to get on the trains and get out of there that my uh, my grandfather's grandfather uh, grandfather's I should say grandfather's grandfather's father um, that was mortally wounded he died uh, died later Uh, he left my grandfather's grandfather a two-year-old son uh, uh, and his namesake my grandfather's namesake Irwin Braden, uh, and his wife, a widow. A, a, a tragic story, and one that, that, I, that I wonder, uh, how did this impact my family? What are the ripple effects through the generations of this story on my family, and as I, as I remember? But, but I'm struck, as I think about John Braden, my ancestor who died in war, Uh, by the language that was used by the leaders of our country during the Civil War. It's startling language again and and resonates strongly with the language that was given by that clergyman, Anglican clergyman, on the 100th anniversary of the Battle of the Somme. The language uh, is probably familiar to you and you've read it whether you know it or not. Um, and maybe made most famous uh, in Abraham Lincoln's, President Abraham Lincoln's second inaugural address. And if you've been to the Lincoln Memorial, you know that the second inaugural address is, is on the wall of the Lincoln Memorial. And a significant portion of that address is given to recognizing that the Civil War, or the assertion that the Civil War was in a sense given to the nation as a consequence of sin. And the particular sin that is named in that address is the sin of slavery. This nation has sinned, Abraham Lincoln said. Offense is the, is the word that he uses in that address. We have offended God. And because of our offense, we have been beset with this terrible Terrible, terrible war. Suffering beyond what we maybe can even imagine today, yet which ripples down to us. Even more startling to me is the the proclamation by Abraham Lincoln at the urging of the U.S. Senate to declare a national day of fasting, recognizing that we have sinned. We are in the midst of this great war because of our sin. We have wronged God. We have offended God. We have acted unjustly as a nation. And so this national day of prayer and fasting and repentance and confession was intended to acknowledge that sin, but also to look internally as a people. What should we do? What can we do as a people to make 
things right. I mean, we're still working at that, right? All these years later. What a different kind of Memorial Day than the kind of triumphalistic drivel that we hear today. Thoughtful, introspective, humble. Well, you're wondering, maybe you're not wondering, maybe it's obvious to you uh, what this has to do with Ezekiel. Ezekiel was a prophet of national introspection. He lived uh, in the early 500s, that means the uh, B.C., which means the higher years, just after the year 600. He was taken off uh, in the early wave of exile, the exiles from Judah off to Babylon. He was a prophet of the exile. He lived in exile, and he lived among the people. And he had a story to tell during this time of national introspection when people were asking, what have we done? What have we done to bring this on ourselves? Why have we been exiled? Why has our nation been destroyed? And the language that Ezekiel uses is very, very similar to the language that's used in that proclamation of prayer and fasting. And I have, it, I have the proclamation of prayer and fasting on my phone because of the technical difficulties. This morning, I don't have it printed out. But I will read that. It could come from Ezekiel. This could be a paraphrase of Ezekiel. It is the duty of nations to own their dependence upon the power of God. Well, that was essential to Ezekiel's message. We have forgotten as a people our dependence on God's power. God called us into being and gave us life as a people, and suddenly we began to believe our own propaganda. We began to believe that we did this ourselves. The proclamation goes on. We want to confess our sins and transgressions and in humble sorrow yet with assured hope that genuine repentance will lead to mercy and pardon. So there was this idea in Ezekiel that we as a people must recognize and confess what we have sinned. The work of Ezekiel was kind of a, kind of a priestly work. Of a, of a, he was a national confessor, if you will. The proclamation goes on to recognize that we have been blessed as a nation, this nation, has been blessed. We have been fortunate beyond belief, and we have forgotten that these blessings, the good things we enjoy, are gifts from God and not things that we have um, created for ourselves. And we have forgotten to treat each other justly. Ezekiel compares the relationship between God and people as a marriage. And if you want to read chapter 16, it's a little racy, maybe. But the narrative is simple. God took us off the streets. God took the people of Israel off the streets. We were hideous. We were nothing. We were street urchins. We were impoverished. And God took us and made us God's own and dressed us up and made us beautiful to behold, a light to the nations. And then, over time, we forsook God we rejected God. We turned away from God. And we came to the conclusion that we have adorned ourselves this way, that we have made ourselves beautiful and glorious. And we have sought by our own devices to make ourselves great. And in our turning away from God, we have ended up here in Babylon, 
in exile, in a season of introspection, a season of soul-searching, wondering what went wrong. Remarkably, that's not the end for Ezekiel. There is gospel. Christians over the ages have looked to the Psalms as our prayer book. Many Psalms uh, jump out at me. Uh, Psalms of confession, many of them. See if there is any wicked way in me. Soul-searching songs, psalms. But other elements of the psalm say, God will never forsake us. Psalm 103, as far as the east is from the west, so far God will remove our transgressions from us. God will take away our transgressions. God will heal us. Psalm 139, we cannot flee from the presence of God. We can reject God, we can run from God, we can try to hide from God, but we cannot flee from God's presence, from God's loving presence, which wants to care for us and restore us. In that great Psalm of David, Psalm 51, which is read in many Christian services on a a regular basis, morning prayer, an evening prayer, and on a number of other occasions like Ash Wednesday. Create in me a clean heart, O God. Not, I'm going to make my heart clean for you, God. No, create in me a clean heart, O God. Cast me not from your presence, Take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and sustain me with your bountiful spirit. It is a recognition at its core that our very life, our very being, that our souls are dependent on God. And that God's grace is a gift to us. And so Ezekiel gives us this text, the text of the valley of the dry bones. Breathe, breathe into the bones. Breathe into these lifeless bodies. Restore them. And the restoration comes not because the people are deserving, but because God will not forsake the people ever. God's love, the fire of God's love cannot be stopped. None can stop the spirit of God. We cannot stop the spirit of God. God's Spirit animates our lives. And there's nothing that we can do to stop it other than to rejoice and be glad, to receive the Spirit. I've struggled with how to end this sermon uh, this week. Um, and one of the things that, that I try to think about when I preach is what can you do? What can you do as a result of of this good news? But sometimes I think the answer is nothing. Don't do anything. You don't have to do anything. The Spirit of God is doing all the work. You don't have to do anything. Don't try. Don't plan. Don't work. Open your arms wide, maybe. That's doing something, I guess. And receive the good news. Receive the gospel. Receive the Spirit. 
we are going to sing as our response to the movement of the Spirit. Uh, Breathe on me, breath of God. I think it's number 356. It's different than the, the, the hymn that's listed in your bulletins. 356. Breathe on me, breath of God. Let us stand as we sing this hymn of response. Good morning. I'm Joe Springer. I stood before you almost a year ago with the assignment of making the College Mennonite Church Ministries Fund fun. I speculated on ways that we might make it simple to accomplish the concept of giving a dime for every dollar we find in our wallets, purses, or accounts. Today, the message perhaps needs to shift to one of making dry bones live. Whatever the method or metaphor, I want to do two things this morning. First of all, I want to thank you for the many ways you support the mission of this congregation. You give time, you give talents, you share your support and your concerns about the many endeavors of the congregation, and yes, you invest the first fruits of your material resources here. And second, I do want to invite you to recommit to investing in the ministries of College Mennonite Church, both during the few weeks remaining in our current fiscal year and in the months ahead as we embark on new opportunities in our congregation's life and ministry. As of the end of April of this year, we had given collectively over a million dollars through this congregation. Of this, about 850,000 was given towards our $1 million general fund goal. In addition, you also have made or paid commitments to give almost that much again to the vision campaign over the next few years. Wow. Sometimes we see the fruits of our giving promptly. Our electricity this morning probably is a gift from the sun and enabled by gifts of many of you. 
Sometimes we wonder where all this money goes. One way to find out is to study the proposed CMC Ministries Fund and join others in discussing this proposal at 11 a.m. today in the Koinonia Room, at 8 a.m. next week, and again at 11 a.m. two weeks from now. What's another way to think about gifts to <coughs> the gifts to CMC Ministries Fund, what they accomplish? We know our pastors struggled with a uh, lack of printing capability this morning. What would have happened if not only that, but we wouldn't have had Larry up there in the balcony uh, making sure that in fact those words did show up on the screen, making it possible to hear what is happening for those who are not present in this room to see and hear what is happening? What if Whitney had not created our orders of worship and the guide to other events in the congregation? Or if Phil had not taken time to prepare a sermon? Many other people, of course, also played roles large and small, volunteer or paid, in preparing the opportunity to gather together in order to worship God, to renew ourselves for the tasks that await us, and to fellowship together. In my personal commitment to the CMC Ministries Fund, I like to think also of the new members <clears throat> we have welcomed to the congregation during the past year of the members who passed away and whose lives we celebrated and mourned. I think of our halls filled with Bible school a week or so from now, our ability to share our facility with others in the community. I think of the ways our congregation partners with local organizations or in short-term or longer periods of service. I am glad to put a dime of every dollar towards participation in these ministries. I welcome you to join in this joy. Every Sunday and each day of the week, the monetary gifts you give through College Mennonite Church are important and appreciated. Your gifts assist the winds of the Spirit to revitalize and resurrect the ministries we, with God's help, seek to carry out together. Thank you for your continued gifts to this important work. Thank you, Joe. We now have the opportunity to participate in giving our tithes and offerings this morning. So I invite you to bring your offerings up to the basket, or if you need assistance, the ushers will be there to help with that. Today is also the end of the month, so if you have a birthday during the month of May that you would like to celebrate, you're invited to bring your birthday offerings forward this morning as well. So let us join together in, in worshiping in this way with our tithes and offerings.
Please join me in prayer. Gracious God, you have sent us your Holy Spirit who animates us, who guides us, who makes us live. With humility, we, we receive this gift with thanks. We ask that this offering would be animated by your spirit, that it would come to life in the ministries of this congregation. Bless it, we pray, for your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. Our closing hymn is 423 in the blue hymnal. May the grace of Christ our Savior. There are two amens at the end of the verse, and we will sing that after the second verse, not the first verse. As you go from here, may the Holy Spirit animate you and may you breathe new life into this dry world and may your soul be filled with holy air from the Spirit. Go in peace. Amen. Amen.